The Cleveland Public Library is a treasure for our city and rich in history. It is the first large-scale public library in the nation to allow people to select their books directly from the bookshelves, thanks to the open shelf plan established in 1890 by librarian William Howard Brett. The landmark building, located as we know it now on Superior Avenue, wasn't the original location. There was legislation in the state of Ohio to enact a public library in cooperation with the Cleveland Board of Education in order to provide books for schools. But it's also a free public library, and at the time, um, a lot of libraries you had to pay to go in, but this was a free public library. And the library was in a number of different places in what we consider downtown Cleveland now. And they were always leased buildings until they built Main Library in 1925. It was important because there was access to the stacks, the shelves. People could actually walk in up to a shelf and get a book. The library stacks are in the central part of the building. There's a lot of light. They're surrounded by large windows which lit the reading rooms. And what's hidden inside is the central court that also provides light to the interior of the building. And the style of the building on the outside is really kind of Beaux-Arts. It's a Walker and Weeks building. But inside, they provided this sort of little secret, which you can see from the third floor if you go down the John G. White corridor. And that's sort of a, a Renaissance, totally different material than the outside of the, the exterior of the building. It's, it's brick, and it's, it's kind of a nice little secret area. There are many unique features that sets our library apart from all the others. The first thing that sets Cleveland Public Library aside from everyone else is that we're the third largest public research library in the country. Um, people don't know that just behind New York and Boston, we have this wonderful institution that has been situated with over 10 million items here available for people to check out throughout. The Cleveland Public Library has the largest collection of material in the world on chess. Surprising enough. And so we're very fortunate that one of our first trustees was a chess aficionado and donated a lot of his chess items to us early on. And then he donated a nice endowment so that anything on chess that should come about, we have. So if you go to our third floor in our special collection, you will find any version of any book on chess that you would ever want, but you'd also find over 400 different chess sets that we've collected over a period of time. So we have many other countries who come and visit us on chess, and we also sometimes host, which I think this is just absolutely crazy, but it's always fun, the uh, International Checkers Championship, because we also carry everything we would want to consider on checkers as well. Our downtown library is is a wonderful institution, but it's also an opportunity for us to say, you know, folks, this, the downtown library is a destination, whether you're in, you know, now in the suburbs, or whether you're in the city, or whether you're visiting from the outside. People don't know that if you look at Travel Advisor, Cleveland Public Library is always in the top 10 of places people come to visit when they come to Cleveland. And so it's a wonderful place for us to visit, but people don't look at us as a destination. So in this sense, we've taken it and, and added things that will make people under, see us as a destination, whether it's our Tech Central downstairs, or we're in the midst of adding to it. The next step is our Cleveland Digital Public Library, where folks from the outside can come in and bring in their personal items that their family might have kind of stored over a period of time that they'd like to digitize and historic items that we might, will be able to then add to the Digital Public Library of America and people all across the country will be able to see maybe something that your grandmother had, had written years ago that has some historic value. Preserving historical items is essential, but at the Cleveland Public Library, it isn't just paperbacks and hardcovers that get the special treatment. The library always kept its institutional records but the archives was organized in about the 1970s. So because you're a public institution, you have to keep your records uh, and you have to 
account for all your public financing. Here's the earliest book, and that's from November 1878 to February 1886. But the library actually started in 1869. So, of course, these are handwritten. Besides papers, we have actual objects like old ink wells or the pieces of glass that people would put their ink wells on that were on their desks, blocks of wood that people write on, um, envelopes that staff members have scribbled drawings on. Anson Smythe, who was a clerk at the beginning of the 20th century, he worked as a nighttime clerk in general reference. Library even then kept statistics about how many people came in and he would write on the envelopes how many people had been in, if there were 40 or 50 people, but then he would draw cartoons on them. So I guess you could say it was sort of an early form of a graphic novel. But apparently he was well loved by the staff because they kept everything. He also wrote poems and I do come across his poems sometimes in uh, main library news notes. Furniture. We actually have furniture in here and an early wastebasket. It's a beautiful kind of copper wastebasket. So yeah, this is the history of the Cleveland Public Library, both in three-dimensional objects and pieces of paper. We need to keep documenting the work that gets done today so that people in 50 years and 100 years from now will know about the staff at the library and what they did to reach people. That is a challenge because we tend not to do documents like they did more than a hundred years ago. Um, we don't document everything through paper correspondence and we're not leaving the same kind of trail. And that is a challenge um, when we say we we don't need paper anymore. Well, we don't know if our computers and our way of storing things is going to be accessible in 10 years or 20 years or 25 years, and we need to leave that trail behind. Wondering if you can see the special artifacts in the archives department firsthand? Yes, they can, but they would have to call to make sure that I'm here, and I would arrange for their, their visit because it's not on a publicly accessible floor, but the contents of the archives is open to the public. Allowing visitors to choose their own books from the shelves isn't the only groundbreaking achievement for the Cleveland Public Library. It is also the first ever to offer a children's room, which began in 1898, thanks again to librarian William Howard Brett. Today, it's become a wonderful space for the youth to learn and play. The Youth Services Department is an area in the Cleveland Public Library that offers programming that has books and materials for children zero through 18. Well, one thing we do is we make sure that we engage with the parents and children that walk in the, the library. That's one of the great features. We're very welcoming. We have a smile on our face. We provide toys for the children. So if they want something to do, we provide that. We have programs that we offer for children and families as well. Our AWE Learning Station and our Smart Table. And with those two features, unlike the computers that we offer here in the department, children do not need to use it with their library card. The Smart Table has educational software as well as the AWE. And both of them are geared toward preparing children for school, uh, whether that be um, learning how to add and subtract or learning geography, it's to prepare them. And we ask parents to engage with their children when they're using it, and they do. Our children's librarians are on the move. We get a number of new materials every single day, whether that is like I mentioned before, the audio books, board books, picture books, and children can't read all of those books in one full swoop. That is where we come in to recommend titles for those age groups. We have the Art Lab, the Art Lab and Studio 470. It's a wonderful place for uh, children to show their creative side, meaning there's movement, there's song, there's dance, there's arts and crafts, 
and it's just an area where they can just come in, we embrace anything and everything about the creative aspect of children developing. We open it weekly from 3.30 to 5.30, and then we have an open studio that we offer on Saturdays for parents. So anytime we're having a huge system-wide program, uh, whether that's Lunar New Year or Winterfest, we open the art lab. And we open up Studio 470 at the same time that we open the art lab from 3.30 to 5.30. But we don't even advertise. We just open the door, teens come in, they want a place to hang out and to socialize and gather, and we provide that. We want parents to be assured that, you know, when they're teen, when they're children, walk in the library that you know that they know that we're providing something for them where it is a safe environment. There are three unique artifacts in the youth services department that visitors have been enjoying for decades. This dollhouse was donated to the library by a former children's librarian Andre Norton. That was her pen name. Her real name was Alice Mary Norton and she gave this beautiful dollhouse to the library in 1966. It was her childhood dollhouse, and we've had it ever since. Miss Norton is no longer with us. She passed away in 2005, but this is part of her legacy as well as her books that she has written for children. The carousel was donated to us by the Sugarman family. In 1998, Joan Sugarman established the Norman A. Sugarman Children's Biography Award. And that award is given every other year to the best biography for children. When the award was established, that carousel was given to the library. And it's been a symbol of the award and for Cleveland Public Library's Children's Department. That globe was donated to the Cleveland Public Library in 1996 by the Eaton Corporation. Now, it did not look like that when the Eaton Corporation donated it to us. So we uh, had children from the Cleveland School District. At the time, it was the Cleveland Municipal School District with the help of local artists to create this beautiful tile mosaic about what the library means to them and diversity. So if you look on there, you'll see many pieces like a cell phone or fish, taxi cabs, and whatever at that time the library meant to the children, that is what you see. And it's a piece of our, kind of it's a piece of uh, history, it's a local piece, it's a treasure that when we're giving tours at the library that the, the students stop, they wanna touch it, they wanna know more about it, and I'm glad that we have it. We offer school tours to educate students and educators about the services that we provide, to give them the basics, the fundamentals of research skills, because sometimes students, when they're at school, they may not know how to do research, whether that's through um, looking, at a book, looking up a book on the database or um, looking up a book in general. And so we give them those fundamentals and then we give them a tour of all the various departments. We have two buildings here two very big buildings with a lot of history and they want to know and they may want to know how to get a library card so that's included in our tour and this may be something that's new to them and we want them to keep returning to the library so I think having these tours gives them an introduction to the library as well as knowing their history and knowing that this is their library and this is why we call it the People's University the Youth Services Department isn't the only fun and safe place visitors of the library can get creative while learning. Tech Central started a few years back when they were looking at Main Library and kind of seeing what had changed since this building was built in 1997 and Main Library was renovated a couple years later. And what they saw is that um, technology and computers had taken a completely different role in the way patrons used the library. When the libraries were renovated, computers were kind of secondary to our research collections and our materials. And now they are definitely a very primary role in the way the library operates and the way people use the library. So they came up with the idea of Tech Central to be kind of a, a central technology hub where not only are you going to get computer access and computer assistance, but every opportunity is an opportunity to learn. And so we wanted to take it and create more than just a computer lab. We wanted to create 
create a creation space or a learning lab. And um, Tech Central formed from that idea. So we consolidated all of our computers here at Main Library. We have a fantastic team of library assistants that can help you in just about any computer question you can think of. And then we have a fantastic maker and creation space where if you have an idea, you can come in, work with one of those library assistants, and turn your ideas into reality. We teach computer classes here at Main Library four days a week, and we teach computer classes in all 27 of our branches every single day of the week. We teach everything from computer basics, so if you've never used a computer before, we can get you up and running, we can get you connected to the internet, we can show you how to get news and data and information, we can sign you up for an email address, and then we can help you out with applications like Microsoft Word and Excel, um, help you improve your job searching skills. We teach a, such a large variety of computer classes and you can always find something in your local branch. Every branch gets computer classes just about once every other month so we always have something new for you to try out. We have such a diverse community and such a diverse skill set within the community. Job skills, employment skills are so reliant upon computer access and there's so many people in our community that are out of work or looking to change fields and so the computer access, uh, the computer classes really allow them an opportunity to learn new skills and to kind of beef up their um, employability skills and to find jobs. And we've had people that we know have found jobs because of the computer classes that they've attended here. We offer hands-on, we call them maker labs, and they're a little different than our computer classes. When you come into a maker lab, you're going to learn one topic and you're going to walk away from that class with something that you've actually made yourself. So we have various things like making 3D printed cookie cutters. We have laser engraved jigsaw puzzles. If you've ever want to learn how to knit, we have easy loom knitting classes. We can also show you how to 3D print out of just cardboard using some scissors. You don't have to have a 3D printer at your disposal. Some of the other services that we have is our tech toy box um, kiosks that you can check out an iPad or a MyCloud laptop. So if you wanted to try out an app on an iPad, you can check one out, sign up for your own Apple account, and then install your own apps and kind of explore the iPad or just use it to access Facebook or the internet or search for jobs. The MyCloud laptops, what's really intriguing about that is typically library computers, when you use them and you sign off, all your data is wiped and so that way the next person can't see any of your data. Well, MyCloud laptops allow you to save all of that data in a secure um, location that only you can access. So when you sign on to your laptop, your background is going to show up. It's just like having a computer at home. All your files are going to be there, your bookmarks are going to be there, and best of all, you can access it here or at three of our branches right now, and all that data will follow through with you. And all you need in order to check out a MyCloud laptop or a iPad is a library card and a driver's license. You can just staff your driver's license and then go up to the kiosk and automatically check out an iPad or a MyCloud laptop to use for three hours. The most important aspect of Tech Central is the learning aspect. We have so many different things from the maker space, the production and the fabrication that you can do in the maker space, to learning how to operate a computer. If you really wanted to, you can come in, learn how to operate a computer, and a few months later be laser engraving your own photo square. We enable you to do that by taking every opportunity we have to work with you and to teach you and to teach you how to operate a computer. If you come in and ask us to complete a task, we're not gonna go click here, click here, click here. We're gonna help you understand why you're clicking and where you're clicking and help you enable those computer skills um, from the very basic computer basics all the way up to um, production and fabrication. I think so many people walk into the library and have um, this kind of vision of a library is kind of dusty, filled with books. Um, and when they walk in, of course we have computers, but they have things like 3D printers and maker spaces. And the fact that we will sit down with any patron on any topic you can think of for an hour at a time just absolutely surprises that we offer so many awesome creative and educational services here. There are several services and programs the library offers. The primary focus of our department is to provide programming for um, all ages, from cradle to grave. <laughs> uh, our primary focus in outreach and programming is children under the age of 18. So roughly 80% of what we do services that age group. And we provide everything from large-scale author visits, cultural programming, art instruction, language instruction, educational services like tutoring, 
or ESOL classes, and everything in between. Brown Bag Book Clubs occur at Main Library, and those are lunchtime book discussions, and most of them came about by patrons that go into the departments are interested in having a book discussion and over time they bring their friends and then you have a good group of people that typically read about one book a month and then come during the lunch hour and eat their lunch and discuss the book. Our branches also have book discussions and again those are developed the same way. We have a large branded author series, Writers and Readers, and that follows the calendar year. So beginning in January, you'll see a new list of authors that will come. And during the year, smaller authors or opportunities that we can't turn down arise, and we bring authors in that way as well. The Friends of the Cleveland Public Library was started in 1957. There's roughly 2,500 members that pay dues. And the Friends are responsible for funding many of the programs and services we offer at the Cleveland Public Library. So through the revenue that they generate, through book sales, through fundraising, they donate generously to library programs. So Summer Reading Club, Writers and Readers, these types of programs are offered with funds that were contributed through Friends of the Cleveland Public Library. Considered one of the 100 most important librarians of the 20th century by the American Library Association, Linda Eastman served as the head librarian from 1918 in 1938. To honor the legacy of Miss Eastman, a beautiful area was named in her honor. In the 50s, the Eastman Reading Garden was dedicated to Linda Eastman, who was one of our original directors. She actually is one of the first female library director of a large library system in the country, was here in Cleveland. And so in her memory, there was this little space in between our main library and what was then the Plain Dealer space, and so they decided to dedicate it as a reading garden, and they named it after Linda Eastman, and it became the Eastman Reading Garden in the 50s. And the connector to that, I mean, I go out and talk to many folks in the community over and over again, and so many people are so tied to the, to the garden. They go there, they have their lunch there, it's a wonderful space for people to go, and so, you know, it's just a wonderful connector between the two buildings. The Eastman Reading Garden isn't the only noteworthy area. There are many remarkable characteristics and beloved sections of the library to experience. My favorite section of the library is the lobby of the main building. It is beautiful. When you walk in here, you forget everything about the traffic outside, the noise outside, you come inside and you're in the lobby. The artwork is beautiful, it's marble, it's like this castle, it's just regal and royal and it has never changed. That's the great thing. I mean, you have a few things here and there, but it's the same as though when it first opened in 1925 and you can just see that. That marble, you know, it. you can't fake that and it's beautiful and I love it. And when you walk up those stairs, you see the popular department. So you walk up the stairs and you walk straight for that and then you go into Brett Hall and it's just like beautiful. So that's my favorite. I don't think I have a favorite. I have many favorites. Obviously I like the archives because this is where I work. Before I came to work here, I did a lot of research in the library, so I used a lot of different departments. The map collection is just incredible and has wonderful things to discover. I use the microform department a lot, fine arts, and especially special collections. And since I'm a staff member here, I can go up in the stacks, and that's a fun thing to do. I think my favorite unique feature about any of our libraries is our architecture. We've been very fortunate through our 144 years of existence that we've had a lot of architects that we've worked with over the period of time. And you know, we're in a, a classic example of that here at Brett Hall in our main building. This building was built in 1925 and uh, the architecture is just you know, astounding. People from across the country come to visit us just to see this building and its architecture. 
I'll tell you that I go up to Special Collections as much as I can. Every time I walk in there, I find something new. They're always working with some of the most unique and rare items that not only this library has to offer, but libraries throughout this country have to offer. And they always have something new on the table, and I love walking up there and kind of seeing some of them showing the history of Cleveland or the library. We have the chess sets up there are just absolutely fantastic. One of the kind of the neat tie-ins that we're doing down here is we are scanning one of our rare chess sets using our 3D scanner, and we're gonna try to replicate a copy of it so people can and hold it, get more tactile with it than you necessarily would be able to with the actual chess set. There's two spaces probably most people don't see, but they're very important to me. One is the lobby to the 10th floor administrative offices. So technically it is a public space, we don't advertise it, um, but the public typically will just kind of find their way up there. On any afternoon you'll see young teens sitting, looking out over the city, and it's one of the most unique views you can have in downtown Cleveland. So there's 10 floors here. You can go up, and the minute you get off the elevator, there's this beautiful view westward of the rooftops, and it's just such a, a pleasant place to be. My second favorite place would be the shipping department, which seems strange, but when you come into a library, you don't get to see what's actually happening in the back end. And so this library serves as a central hub for all Clevenet libraries. So on a daily basis, you're seeing a tremendous amount of materials come in and then go back out to our member libraries. And for me, it's inspiring and it assures me that libraries are here to stay. There are neighborhood branches of the library and even in schools. But what many people don't know about is the Public Administration Library, located in historic Cleveland City Hall. Well, it's very unique in the sense that you don't find public administration libraries in many library systems across the country. So for us to have that connector inside our City Hall is, it separates itself from many other library systems just in that light. But it's great in the sense that the community members who sometimes might need some assistance on legal things can go into the public administration library. We have a lot of legal books and a lot of technology there and access to our staff that will be able to help you with legal questions that might be able to be answered. We also have popular materials in there as well so if you're in the library and you go into the City Hall from time to time you can have any book throughout the system of Cleveland Public Library sent to that library and you can pick it up there. It's an incredible resource for all kinds of information. It is a hidden gem, I'd say, inside City Hall. Having partnerships with the City of Cleveland and various organizations are vital for the Cleveland Public Library. We partnered with many, and uh, one of them is the uh, City of Cleveland Department of Recreations, where we serve lunches every summer that ties in with our summer reading club. So however long the Summer Reading Club is, is when we serve lunches, and that's with our 27 locations, including the main library. The partnership with CMSD is one that's very important, one that really helps us thrive as a library. Their partnership is vital to the success of our Summer Reading Club. Not only CMSD, their educators, their teachers, their school librarians, they get the word out and they help us. We partner with the Federal Reserve of Cleveland, and this is where the financial literacy programs come into play. We partnered with them, and there are many more, but that was, that's one that really, truly I'm happy that we, that, we, that we do. We've been doing that for many years. Pre-1950, many of the libraries in the schools were underneath the public library. And as school libraries started to kind of move out, we continued to just concentrate and focus on public libraries. But in that, there was always this connector of how can we serve the school libraries and be more of a connector with them, and how do we serve the, the school children to make sure that as soon as they come out, they have these great libraries to, to use after hours. And so one of the newest CMHD schools the library is connected right to that on its campus and so we're continuing to look at how in the future as schools or new schools are made that new libraries are attached so that these libraries and these schools create these wonderful campuses. The employees of the Cleveland Public Library take pride in their work and they show it in more ways than one. The recognition that last year when we were going through some really difficult times and we had to cut back some hours, 
And despite all of that, our public voted for our levy by 76%, the highest uh, approval rating we've had for any levy we've ever done. It said that people really still love their library. Now, that, from a, the big standpoint, was something that I was very, very proud of. But I think it was, a, I had a situation a, about a year ago where I was going into one of our libraries, and a gentleman stopped me, and he said, I just wanted you to know how important your library has been to me. He said, you know, two years ago, I, I was in a very difficult situation. My wife had left me. I was with my two daughters, and I, I lost my job. And so I would come into the library every day after school with my daughters, and I'd be sitting there just trying to do job applications, and I know they were, you know, studying or whatever, and we bonded as a family. Six months ago, I found this great job. We'd be doing this, and it's because of the library that I was able to change my life and be there for my kids. And then he started crying, and it was, it was just like, you know, you didn't know what to say, and he goes, I just want to thank you for all you do. And it was like one of those moments where I really understood the importance of what I do. You know, my staff and the staff at all our libraries work very hard to make sure that people have those opportunities. My job is just to make sure that they have the opportunity to do that for them. And so, you know, it's just one of those points where you really understand the importance of what you do as a, as a work. The most rewarding moments, those moments where you kind of see the, the light bulb kind of pop over somebody's head when they go, I have an idea, I just learned something new and I want to be able to do this. When teaching people how to use computers or how to access internet or how to access news, you can kind of see the joy in being able to gain all that access in a world that kind of enjoys that access on an everyday basis. And so it's great to see somebody be able to learn and to be able to help themselves on the computer. And the other moments are when you show somebody how to do something creative and they go, this is awesome. I had a great great moment the other day and teaching a bunch of people how to knit. And it's something that not a lot of people know about me is that I do know how to knit and we were doing some easy loom knitting to kind of start people off and they were just so excited and we're donating all of the stuff that we make to warm up Cleveland. And so it, just absolutely um, fantastic moments where you're showing somebody how to do something new and they're helping the community in the process. You can always look at the catalog online and it's a good thing to do that. But if you actually come in and you start looking at a bookshelf, it may lead you to something else. So you learn by just by pure chance. Another thing is you may start off in one department, but we hope your horizon is broadened and you end up maybe in another department or three different departments or the librarian send you, oh, if you want that information, you need to go over here. So you learn by discovery. Acknowledging children for their, their achievements. So with summer reading clubs, with writing workshops that we do, or art programs, the opportunity to acknowledge a child for their accomplishments in the library is by far the most rewarding experience that we, that we have. So, and fortunately, those occur quite frequently. What's rewarding is knowing that a child can come back to you after you've recommended a book and tell you, oh my gosh, I really enjoy this book. Do you have more books like that? That's rewarding because they don't have to necessarily do that. A child doesn't have to do that, but they do to let you know that whatever you recommended, they enjoyed it. Now, I may get a child that says, ah, that, book, that didn't work for me, but do you have any other recommendations? Or a parent may say, I don't know. Um, this may not work for them, is there anything else? I feel I'm educating a lot of parents and children on the love of reading and books. That's rewarding, and it's something that um, I will continue doing forever. Our previous director, Andrew Venable, who really looked at this as the place, wherever your circumstance, whatever your age, it is an opportunity for you to come and learn. So whether you're three or 83, whether you have a GED or a PhD, this is a place for you to come and make yourself better. A lot of people do kind of just wander in on a tour of downtown and the staff, which is a really big asset and a really treasure of the Cleveland Public Library, loves to tell people about whatever's in their subject department and they're actually the best ones who can describe what they have in their department and they love to show up what they have what's in the library. We're here from Monday through Saturday 
10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and come and visit us. Even if, if it's your first time, come and visit us. If it's your fifth time, continue to visit us and know that when you walk into the Youth Services Department that you are welcome, that we have programs for you and your children and we are ready to serve you in any way possible. Whether you're looking for a book, whether you're looking for a magazine, we have the materials for you. And I want them to know that it's been that way since we, since we were established. The focus of children has been ingrained in this library system, and it will continue even when I'm gone. And we want them to know that that legacy will be, always be there. So I want families to know, I want teachers to know, I want educators to know that this library system is here for you. It's for the people. Without them, there would be no us. We would not be here for it if it wasn't for them, and we thank you.